diplomats. Now you are seeing outright fighting between the two. And there's this idea circulating out there, maybe the U.S. should partner with someone they call a war criminal, Bashar al-Assad, to take on ISIS. The reason that question is even being raised is because of what David's talking about, not really having a clear ally in the region in terms of Arab countries being willing to fight alongside the U.S. on this one. But it's also because while U.S. airstrikes are backed up by movements on the ground by Kurds and Iraqi army in Iraq. In Syria, there is no Syrian uh, moderate opposition that's been trained to be an army. What backs up airstrikes? And it's still not clear what that strategy is going to be if you get a coalition to hit uh, through some coordinated action. Well, when was it? It was not so long ago that there was a debate within the administration on whether we should uh, give uh, some sort of support to those, uh, to the good uh, Syrian uh, rebels uh, that are, were fighting Assad. We famously know now that uh, Secretary Clinton wanted to do that. The president uh, vetoed it. Uh, and that was well, about a year ago, wasn't it? Right. Uh, well, it was almost exactly a year ago that the U.S. was having a conversation about strikes uh, against the Syrian regime. And those were called off. And almost exactly a year later, we're talking about hitting uh, what the U.S. sees as a new enemy, ISIS, here. Um, ISIS has been fighting the moderate rebels that we've been saying we've been supporting. They have been at war with each other. Um, and so in the absence of alternatives, you're left with these two uh, very dirty partners here, right? Do you go with ISIS? Do you go with the, the Assad regime? It's not clear what the U.S. can do if they can um, quickly train moderates to step up and fill that gap or whether they even want to. Susan, let's talk a little bit about uh, Paul Ryan coming out with uh, this book where he now turns out he was very strongly against shutting down the government. He didn't say much about it at the time uh, when Republicans did that, but uh, uh, I suppose he is laying the groundwork to run for president. If it works out, uh, he'll do it, but he's taking the first early steps. I think he's far from making that decision, though, wouldn't you? You know, Bob, I have a slightly different impression. I went to Janesville to interview him about his, about his book about 10 days ago, and I got the impression that he is somebody we haven't seen in town for a long time, and that is a legislator. He's taking over the House Ways and Means Committee uh, in the new Congress. He wants to do a big tax overhaul. He wants to deal with entitlements. And I got the impression that kind of in the tradition of Jack Kemp, he cares um, as much about instituting the policy as he does about getting the position. Now, that's not to say he wouldn't like to be president or he won't try to run for president, but he's just 44 years, ago, 44 years old now. I really got the impression he might just focus on Congress and how long has it been since we've had somebody who actually wants to pass legislation in Congress. Well, and uh, uh, being the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, which is where all tax bills originate in the Congress, uh, is no small chairmanship. That is probably the most powerful a post, I would say, uh, on uh, Capitol Hill once you get past the, the leadership, the speaker, and so forth. You know, we used to call it the Powerful House Ways and Means Committee, and we've stopped calling it that because so little gets done on Capitol Hill now. But we saw uh, Paul Ryan and Patty Murray, the Democrat chairman, Democratic chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, make a deal on the budget in just a couple months ago. Uh, so maybe there's some possibility for seeing something happening on the Hill that puts to shame the last couple of years when everything's been gridlocked. And, and uh, you know, the other part, uh, talking uh, uh, about Paul Ryan and whether or not he's going to run, this little joint appearance he made with Mitt Romney the other day where he said, uh, well, he tried to tease him about whether he was going to run again. I, in the back of my mind, think if, think if things break right and uh, Republicans can't kind of figure out where they want to go, Mitt Romney might be the nominee again. Yeah, Nobody yeah. has told me that, but I, again, this, this just keeps popping up. You know, I interviewed uh, Mitt Romney's wife uh, after the election, and I, th I asked her if he might run again, thinking she would say, never again, we will never do that. She did, she did not rule it out. I think it's possible that you could, you know, uh, people who run for president often find they kind of like it and want to run again. And again, we saw that even with someone like George McGovern and, and others who, even after they've been defeated, want to want to run again. So I, I agree. I think it is possible to see a scenario where Mitt Romney runs again, could even once again be the Republican nominee. All right, Susan Page, thank you, thank you guys. We'll be right back with a preview of a new memorial in Washington, so stay with us. Susan Page of USA Today, Margaret Brennan of CBS, and David Rode of Reuters were the roundtable participants this week on Face the Nation from CBS. Washington's great memorials and monuments are really an index of American values. 
signs to the world of what we honor, what we consider important. This fall, one more memorial will open, and it is long overdue. It recognizes those who have been disabled for life defending their country. One of the driving forces behind the memorial is actor Gary Sinise, who became an activist for the disabled after playing a disabled vet in the movie Forrest Gump. In the 90s when I played uh, Lieutenant Dan, that's when I got involved with our wounded uh, through the DAV, Disabled American Veterans Organization. They invited me to their national convention. You know, I really didn't know what to expect, and I walked out on that stage and I saw 2,000 injured service members uh, applauding me for playing a role, and it was very, very moving and stayed actively involved with the DAV uh, now for going on 20 years and been involved with the the memorial here for about the last eight eight years or so. Decades in the making, the memorial will occupy a prominent site at the foot of Capitol Hill and once completed will feature a huge fountain. For Sinise, it comes not a minute too soon. There are over three, three million uh, who live on with uh, amputations and traumatic brain injury and uh, severe burns and blindness and uh, mental illness because of their the things that they've seen and to have them come here and to be able to feel that the nation has recognized their sacrifices and is honoring them with this special tribute is going to be very special i think sinise has literally spent years holding benefits visiting wounded vets and lobbying for their cause the memorial he hopes will help america to better know and understand their story what do you hope people get out of this um, well, I hope it heightens awareness. Awareness is so much a part of uh, uh, helping to heal and to support these folks. Um, so many people aren't really aware. If you don't have a personal relationship with somebody in the service, most of the country is disconnected from the, from the military, yet we're fighting wars all the time. We're always deploying somewhere. We just want folks to remember the cost of war. These are our defenders. They're our freedom providers. Uh, they go out there and they serve their country and sometimes bad things happen. They get killed or they get injured and they have to live with their, their injuries. This place, I hope, will, will just raise awareness, continue to keep awareness up. Somebody coming here who has no relationship with a wounded soldier may leave here and decide, you know what, I'm going to look for the veterans in my community, in my home, uh, hometown, and see if, if they need assistance. That's an important thing. If every community around this country took care of their veterans and just said, look, we appreciate your service. We know you've been going through a tough time. We're, gonna, we're here to help you. We'd have our problem solved. Washington's newest memorial opens in October, a tribute to the millions who gave so much, but a testament as well to the awful cost of war. Face the Nation from CBS is one of the five Sunday TV talk shows you can hear rebroadcast every Sunday afternoon here on C-SPAN Radio beginning at 12 noon Eastern. We're on 90.1 FM in the Washington, D.C. area. Nationwide, you can find us on XM Satellite Radio, Channel 120. You can download our free app for your smartphone or tablet or listen to us online at cspan.org. Indiana Governor Mike Pence, our guest this week on Newsmakers, on C-SPAN Radio, considered by some a 2016 potential presidential candidate. He's asked about U.S. foreign policy. I do hold to the view that, that, um, that, uh, that weakness arouses evil. And uh, uh, the perception of, uh, of American withdrawal, uh, the perception of America pulling back, uh, I, I truly do believe has emboldened uh, the um, uh, enemies of, of freedom, of course, uh, uh, around the world, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and it will be by communicating a stronger commitment to our allies and a, a stronger economic and military relationship in Europe uh, that will be a key forward. On Newsmakers, later today on C-SPAN Radio. Newsmakers coming up at 6 p.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN Radio. Next, a discussion on the powers of the executive branch of government as they pertain to immigration law. This conversation was part of the American Bar Association's Homeland Security Law Institute's annual conference here in Washington. Panelists explored the politics of immigration and the concept of prosecute 
prosecutorial discretion that allows federal agencies to choose the extent to which laws should be enforced. They also look at possible future actions by the Obama administration to defer the deportation of immigrants. Widener University Law and Government Institute Director Jill Family begins this hour-long event. Good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to be here this afternoon and to help to bring you this really wonderful and timely panel about executive power in immigration law. Um, this is a very important topic, one of those sort of rip from the headlines kind of panels. Um, Congress, through the Immigration and Nationality Act, has delegated authority over immigration law to the executive branch. And the executive branch has consistently and historically exercised much, much discretion uh, when it comes to the enforcement of immigration law. Um, this discretion is exercised through a complex web of federal agencies. Um, we have the Department of Homeland Security playing a big role. The Department of Homeland Security houses ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, also within DHS is CBP, Customs and Border Patrol. Um, and USCIS, also within DHS, uh, USCIS is United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. The Department of Justice also plays a role. The Department of Justice um, houses the immigration court system. The Department of Labor plays a role in some types of immigration benefit applications. And the Department of State plays a role in issuing visas outside of the United States or permission for uh, individuals to travel to the United States. So, um, you know, when we think about the executive branch in terms of immigration law, those are the main players in terms of the federal agencies. Now, um, the nature and the scope of executive power over immigration law has been in the news recently, and I'll just give you um, two quick examples. One is the fairly recent program called DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, which, issue, which the government issues a promise not to deport uh, foreign national, young foreign nationals who meet the DACA eligibility requirements. So it doesn't grant a legal status, but it is a promise not to deport for a certain period of time. Um, and sort of the second big example is g literally going on right now. Um, we've heard messages uh, from President Obama's administration that he's considering possible further action um, in exercising discretion over the enforcement of immigration law um, in the face of 13 plus years, give or take, of attempts um, to, for legislative reform in Congress that have not succeeded in a bill that's been passed um, and signed into law. So with that little bit of background, I want to briefly introduce you to our three speakers this afternoon. Um, and I'm so happy that they were all able to join us. Um, these are three individuals who are really, uh, you know, sort of a dream team wish list of speakers on this topic. So I'm so excited um, that they're here. Um, our first speaker today is going to be Marshall Fitz. Um, he is filling in um, for Esther Oliveria, who at the last minute was unable to join us. Um, Marshall Fitz is the Director of Immigration Policy at the Center for American Progress. He is a key legislative strategist for immigration reform um, and has been so for many, many years. Um, he frequently appears on national and regional television and radio stations talking about immigration reform. Um, and he has held several positions in his career where he's been a leader, as I said, in, um, in pushing for immigration reform in the United States. So we're very happy um, to have Marshall here with us today. Um, next, we'll have Shoba Wadia, who is the Samuel Weiss Faculty Scholar, uh, Clinical Professor of Law, and Director of, for the, of the Center for Immigrants' Rights at Dickinson Penn State Law. And uh, Professor Wadia um, is one of the leading experts on prosecutorial discretion in immigration law um, here in the United States. And so we're so happy to have her here with us to talk about this topic. Um, and Shoba, uh, Professor Wadia and Margaret Stock, their full biographies are included in your um, packets if you want to read more about them. Um, our third speaker will be Margaret Stock who is an immigration attorney uh, from Anchorage, Alaska. So, Margaret, you might win the award for 
for this traveler to attend this conference. So thank you so much for coming. Um, Margaret is an expert, um, not only just in immigration law generally, but also immigration law as it intersects with uh, issues involving the military um, and also constitutional law issues uh, and immigration law. Um, perhaps uh, the most important piece of information I can tell you about Margaret is that she is the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. Um, so I should just say, She's a genius and sit down and we'll listen to whatever you have to say. Um, so we're going to let these three speakers talk and then at the end we will have about 10 minutes or so for your questions. And so you just ask if you do have a question at the end when I open up for questions, if you'll come up to the mic to ask your question, that would be great. Um, so I'm going to sit down and um, Marshall, if you would lead us off, that'd be great. Can you hear me in the back? Oh, there you go. Um, thanks so much, uh, Jill. I'm obviously a weak substitute for Esther Oloveria, so um, bear with me. It's a, kind of a last-minute pitch-hitting uh, pinch hitting effort here. Um, but as Jill noted, this is an extremely timely uh, discussion, uh, one you probably... the the conference organizers probably couldn't have planned better had they, um, had they uh, really tried. Um, because the president has announced that he is likely to issue uh, more executive actions on immigration uh, in, in the coming weeks, literally. Um, before we get to what those actions might look like, though, um, I'm going to try to kick things off by quickly reviewing how we actually got to this point. In June of last year, as Jill mentioned, the Senate passed a historic immigration reform bill. Um, the legislation would revamp our legal immigration system. It would have uh, massively expanded uh, border uh, security infrastructure and personnel, and uh, it would have established a process for the 11.5 million unauthorized immigrants living in the United States to come forward uh, and earn legal status and eventually citizenship. Since the Senate bill passed, though, we're here at, I guess, month 14, um, House Republican leaders have talked about the need for reform, but have refused to bring any legislation actually to the floor. Uh, in January, Speaker Boehner issued a set of standards that was to guide the conference uh, on evaluating uh, immigration legislation. Um, within a week, though, after internal objections uh, from some elements within his party, he put those standards on ice and uh, declared that his party's distrust of the president was too great and uh, that it made it too difficult to move forward with immigration at that time. Behind the scenes, though, uh, the speaker repeatedly asked the president to um, provide him some additional time before he took any actions on his own to prepare the conference for uh, moving forward on legislation. It was widely understood by many of us, and I think it was kind of widely assumed in, in, in the press that um, House Republicans were making a political calculation that they didn't want to engage this issue, immigration reform, um, until they had made it through several rounds of primaries, uh, including a big round in June. With the Senate bill um, waiting in the wings um, and uh, it, it having uh, worked so hard to get that across the finish line, the president and many advocates uh, didn't want to declare the legislative process dead prematurely. Uh, you don't just snap your fingers in this town and uh, get a, a serious piece of bipartisan legislation uh, like 744 was uh, accomplished. So uh, we, like the president, um, compartmentalized our skepticism about whether or not the Republicans would move forward and really bent over backward to give them that space um, to try to find a, a sweet spot within their, their conference to, to bring legislation forward. But meanwhile, frustration in communities across the country um, was mounting because the record immigration enforcement uh, was continuing as aggressively as ever while the legislation remained at this impasse. So President Obama asked Secretary Johnson to conduct a review of the agency's deportation policies. This is something that Johnson had promised to, to many of us um, even prior to his conference, co confirmation, but now he was under a direct order uh, to basically determine what steps the agency could take to re further refine their policies and bring them into line with the, the administration's priorities. At the same time, the president asked immigration reform advocates um, to keep the pressure on the House of Representatives to, to try to break the gridlock um, and, and 
and he basically asked us to give the House Republicans kind of a final window in, in which to um, move legislation. But he also promised that if they refused to do so, um, that he was going to do what he could within his legal authority uh, to start fixing the system. Now, it's hard for us to know, and maybe time will tell at some juncture, uh, how serious the, the House leadership ever was about moving legislation. It seems clear that the Speaker himself is committed to the issue and understands that this is critically important to the long-term viability of his party. Um, but it also seems clear that there were really deep divisions within the leadership uh, that rank and file uh, members were asking, why are we going to move forward on an issue that's uh, you know, potentially so divisive to, to our conference uh, when the prospects for uh, success in, in the midterms look so good? Um, of course, we were making the exact opposite argument, which is um, it, when conditions are so favorable and you've got the wind at your backs, that's the perfect time to try to tackle an issue that may be internally tricky. But then when uh, Majority Leader Cantor uh, lost his primary to a Tea Party candidate, Boehner and the rest of the leadership team um, viewed that as a decisive factor in refusing to bring legislation to the floor. Uh, now, Cantor, of course, was never actually a supporter of immigration reform, so this wasn't a real litmus test on uh, kind of the electoral import of the issue. Um, but the threat to the establishment incumbents by Tea Party insurgents that was represented in, in Cantor's defeat seemed, uh, was deemed sufficiently great to uh, terminate the prospects of compromise really on a range of issues, but certainly on an issue like this uh, that, has su that generates such kind of heat and vocal opposition among um, cer certain elements of the party. Um, and so with that, the Speaker, um, when that happened, the Speaker reached out to the President and said, look, we're not going to be moving forward. We're not going to be advancing any legislation this year. Um, and the, so the President's uh, pretty much immediate response was um, to call Attorney General Holder and Secretary Johnson to provide, and ask them uh, to provide recommendations by the end of the summer for what could be done within the administration's legal, excellent legal authority to start fixing the system. Shoba and Margaret are going to, um, I think, sketch the, the parameters of that legal authority. But before I turn it over to them, I think it might be helpful for me to just frame the backdrop um, against which any executive actions addressing the undocumented population. So there's a, an array of executive actions that, that could be taken and, and a menu of options that we think will be under consideration when, at, at this next decisional point. Um, but v, simply vis-a-vis -vis the current undocumented population, um, I, I want to kind of just sketch where, kind of what the context is for that. First, we obviously didn't get to this point overnight. Um, the problems in the system, especially with the large-scale uh, undocumented immigration, they've mushroomed over the last 20 years. Uh, and this isn't the first Congress that's tried and failed to reform the system. Uh, we were on the cusp of an overhaul in 2001 when the 9-11 attacks hit. Um, the, then in 2005 and in 2006, they came back to the issue, and the House and Senate passed their own competing versions of what reform should look like. Uh, then in 2007, uh, bill died on the, the Senate floor uh, at a point where we were extre extremely hopeful about uh, kind of that the, the politics had reached the, the point where uh, we were going to be able to get something over the finish line. Um, and we never got off the launch pad in, in uh, the Obama administration's first term, although it did receive a lot of congressional attention and we had a vote on the DREAM Act. And, um, and, and so there, there were the, the issue never really left the front burner, but it just not, it never got um, we never started the process of cooking it. Um, so while Congress, though, over this period has failed to actually overhaul the system and, and overhaul the laws um, themselves, it has succeeded in appropriating really astronomical sums um, to enforce the existing broken system. Um, just during the president's tenure, I think there's been about a hundred billion dollars spent on immigration and border enforcement. Um, the United States now spends some three and a half billion dollars more on immigration and border enforcement than on all other federal law enforcement combined. Um, uh, it, it's a total of somewhere between 17 and 18 billion dollars. Uh, that's higher than the annual GDP of 85 countries. So, I mean, we're spending a king's ransom every year um, in an effort to enforce our way to a solution and 
um, here we are today with the system as broken as ever. And the impact of that increased enforcement, uh, both on American families, businesses, and communities, has reached a breaking point. Some 85% of the current undocumented population has lived in this country for over a decade. Marshall Fitz is the Director of Immigration Policy at the Center for American Progress. He took part in this conversation on immigration law and executive power that was hosted by the American Bar Association's Homeland Security Law Institute here in Washington on Friday. You're listening to C-SPAN Radio, WCSPFM, Washington. It means they're deeply rooted here. They've got American families. They may own businesses. They're, um, they're very valuable workers. Um, they are long settled and they are well integrated in, into our communities. Um, yet they're also being deported in record numbers. Since 2001, some four million people have been deported. Uh, since just since the president, uh, this the current president took office, some two million people have been deported. Um, just to put that in context. Uh, that's like um, in a five and a half year period wiping out the entire combined population of Boston, Miami, Seattle, and St. Louis. It's just, it's, you know, it's a breathtaking hole in our uh, in, in communities around this country. Um, President Obama has argued um, because he's been pressed on this, pressed aggressively by uh, particularly those of us on the left um, to uh, rein in these deportation policies. Um, but he didn't build the, the battleship that he is uh, the commander of right now. Um, and, and he has claimed and, and asserted on numerous occasions that he doesn't have uh, the authority to simply stop all the deportations. Um, in one critical sense, of course, he's right. Uh, only legislation can provide uh, a permanent solution that includes a path uh, to legal status and citizenship for the, the unauthorized immigrants living here. And any administrative relief via executive authority um, is going to be, or executive action is going to be temporary. It's, it's not going to, um, it could be subject to uh, revision or re reversal by a subsequent administration. And it's likely not going to cover the entire undocumented population. So, in other words, it is by definition going to be inadequate and incomplete. But the president can do a lot more administratively to make immigration enforcement more rational and more humane while Congress continues to, to be suffering from uh, this paralysis. And, and that is because the administration has wide administrative latitude in deciding how to enforce the laws, uh, how to spend the resources that Congress appropriates, um, and uh, whether to pursue enforcement against certain specific individuals. It also has the discretion to identify individuals with certain equities, maybe uh, mitigating factors like how long someone's lived in this country, uh, what their family ties are, what their uh, employment experience is like, and authorize them to affirmatively request temporary relief from deportation. And it's that type of policy that uh, we hope to see within the next several weeks. And it's that type of policy uh, that's going to be scrutinized for its legal authority. And so with that, let me turn it over to some of the experts to talk about that legal authority. Thank you so much, Marshall. And uh, sure. Professor Wadia, your turn. Tell us about that legal authority. Thank you, Professor Family, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, and to Mr. Whitley for featuring immigration um, in this Homeland Security Institute. Um, Marshall's provided a great backdrop for how we got here and the ask by some for the administration to exercise discretion wisely and widely. Shoba Wadia is a law professor at Penn State University and founder and director of the Center for Immigrants' Rights. So what I'm going to do here is talk a bit more technically about the role of prosecutorial discretion in immigration law. It's certainly not a recent phenomena, um, but it's critical to understanding um, as we look ahead to um, what the Obama administration might do. So what is prosecutorial discretion in immigration? Um, it refers to the agency's decision or choice about the extent to which the immigration laws should be enforced against a person or a group, if at all. 
Um, and it's been part of the system for decades, perhaps as long as the system has operated. Um, you may think of prosecutorial discretion to be just one form, like maybe in a criminal context, a prosecutor choosing not to file charges um, or choosing which charges to file. Um, certainly that type of PD also applies in immigration law, but there are more than two additional dozen forms of prosecutorial discretion. There are these so-called non-enforcement actions, a decision to refrain from taking action, like not serving a charging document or notice to appear on a non-citizen, or not filing that charging document with the immigration court, which is the trigger for removal proceedings. There are as well, as Marshall alluded to, affirmative acts, right, that the agency may um, take um, to grant temporary reprieve to a person or group of persons. So some of the historical types of prosecutorial discretion that have been carried out in this way include stays of removal, parole, and deferred action. In fact, the DACA program that Professor Family mentioned is one form of deferred action. So where does this prosecutorial discretion come from? Is it legal? Where's the authority, right? Well, this concept is grounded in the U.S. Constitution, in the statute, in case law, in regulations that are binding on the agency, as well as policy, or as administrative law scholars like to say, sub-regulatory guidance. Right? So if we look at some of the case law, even the U.S. Supreme Court has acknowledged that prosecutorial discretion exists, right? And that the administration and executive has broad authority to decide how enforcement dollars should be spent, um, if at all. Oh, and by the way, equities um, matter too. Um, in addition, there are several for federal court cases um, dating to at least back in in the 1970s looking at deferred action and the extent to which denials of deferred action are reviewable. Again, another example that um, this concept of prosecutorial discretion is recognized in the legal system. Similarly, um, as alluded to by Professor Family, Congress has delegated much authority um, to the agencies, right? So right there, smack in the beginning of the Immigration Code, formerly called the Immigration and Nationality Act, sometimes compared second in complication to the U.S. Tax Code, is a broad statutory provision giving the Secretary of Homeland Security authority to administer and enforce the immigration laws of the United States. Perhaps that is the most important statutory provision um, driving the authority to exercise discretion. But there are other sections in the statute that also speak to this prosecutorial discretion. For example, Section 242G um, of the Immigration and National Nationality Act talks about the non-reviewability of certain forms of prosecutorial discretion like the commencement of removal proceedings and the execution of removal orders. Why would Congress have explicitly barred judicial review on certain acts of prosecutorial discretion if it didn't exist? Right. Similarly, another section of the Immigration and Nationality Act, 237 and 204, talk about the use of deferred action for certain victims of crime, trafficking, and abuse. And again, this is a preferred tool that was named by Congress and has been exercised by the agencies for years um, around this concept of prosecutorial discretion. So let's continue on our journey fr from the statute to the regulations, right? Agencies are guided by binding regulations. Um, and for immigration experts, it's many times the 8 CFR. Um, and so within the regulations, there is a specific one that authorizes um, work authorization for individuals who have been granted deferred action if they can show economic necessity. So there's an independent ground.
ground for work authorization in the regulations based on having been granted deferred action. Um, there's another regulation that does the same thing for another form of prosecutorial discretion called orders of supervision. And then finally, the body of guidance that you may be the most familiar with are the policy memoranda. Right? We have the DACA memorandum from 2012. We have the um, popularly named Morton memos from 2010 and 11. But even prior to that, and in prior administrations, you know, INS, which is the old agency abolished before the Department of Homeland Security was created, issued a string of memoranda affirming the role of prosecutorial discretion in immigration law. Um, Sam Bernson in 1976 issued a memorandum. Doris Meisner and Bo Cooper issued memoranda in 1990 and 2000. Um, so we really have a string of policy guidance that talks about the authority and practice and theory of PD. So we have this legal authority. What are the limits and who qualifies, right? Um, well, there are certainly limits to the non-citizen who is granted one of these forms of prosecutorial discretion. PD does not create a formal legal status. Um, it does not allow for an independent path to permanent residency or U.S. citizenship or direct derivative um, benefits either. Um, similarly, um, the agency cannot affirmatively grant citizenship, for example, to somebody who doesn't qualify for naturalization um, or can't affirmatively give a green card to someone who is otherwise ineligible under the law. Um, so those are some of the limits that apply to prosecutorial discretion. There's been quite a bit of talk about the take care clause, right, in the Constitution and the extent to which that is being violated. Thus far, my view is that those arguments really lack a foundation, at least as a legal matter. Um, in fact, I would go as far to say that um, sound prosecutorial discretion is in line right, with faithful execution and enforcement of the immigration laws. And the Supreme Court has, in fact, said so. It is when the administration is using resources wisely um, and conscientiously that um, laws are being faithfully executed. And beyond that, we are not in a situation where the administration has failed to enforce the laws, right? Um, I think we heard some of the numbers from Marshall earlier in this past year alone, um, roughly 400,000 people have been removed. And beyond even physical removals, there are all types of enforcement actions that the agency can and has taken, um, including arrest, interrogation, detention, um, etc. Finally, um, and just to end on a, a bit more of an appealing note, um, let's talk a bit about the theory of prosecutorial discretion, right? Shobha Wadia is a professor of law at Penn State University. First, that there are these e limited economic resources, right? That might be a little bit of law and theory. But the second theory is more humanitarian, right? That there are people who are here that have laid down roots, some, as Marshall mentioned, have been here for 10 years or longer, right? But they don't have a formal legal way to be here. So what should the agency do? In a world where resources are limited and there are scores of individuals who present compelling equities, like a serious medical condition, long-term residence, a relative who is a green card holder, or a DACA beneficiary, um, or a U.S. citizen, um, what kind of affirmative relief can we provide, or the administration rather, provide within the bounds of the law? And this human humanitarian theme in prosecutorial discretion is not a new phenomena. These same types of um, equities, age, health, long-term residence, 
um, the presence of family members. Those are the same kinds of equities that INS used to exercise prosecutorial discretion um, in the 70s. So I'll end there um, and leave it to Professor Stock to talk a little bit more about categorical grants of prosecutorial discretion and beyond. Thank you. to be talking to you about the issue of executive authority in immigration law. Uh, one of the reasons why I ended up with that famous uh, grant from the MacArthur Foundation was for work I did under the Bush administration to use existing legal authorities to benefit U.S. national security by using immigration laws. And Margaret Stock is an immigration and citizenship law attorney. Capitalizing on the dysfunction of the immigration laws to benefit the Department of Defense. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit because I think it's a good example of um, one of the, you know, deep mysteries of American politics is everybody agrees the immigration system is broken, but nobody wants to fix it. And there are some people out there benefiting from the dysfunction of the system, which is, is rather interesting. Um, other speakers today mentioned the politics behind the problems with reforming our immigration system today. And I think you, if you're interested in this issue, the underlying uh, issues are well laid out in the current issue of Foreign Affairs magazine, which has a picture of a very broken American capital on the front cover, and the statement from my former Harvard teaching colleague Gideon Rose uh, in the introduction, American politics today are marked by dysfunction, discontent, and ideological churn on both sides of the aisle. And then there's another article in the magazine, which I'd also urge you to look at by David Frum, arguing that the Republican Party's central problem today is its increasing dependence on the old and the rich, and a revival of its fortunes will have to wait for the emergence of a truly multi-ethnic, socially tolerant conservatism. And from, of course, would talk to you about immigration reform as well as being part of that. Now, the legal framework is further complicated by the fact that immigration law itself is a technical mess. Uh, I think the best quote on this topic comes from a spokesperson who was speaking for the old Immigration and National Naturalization Service, although she went on to work for the Department of Homeland Security. She was speaking on the record in the Washington Post, Karen Kroshauer, and she said, quote, immigration law is a mystery and a mastery of obfuscation. Uh, she also went on to comment that the lawyers who understand it are worth their weight in gold. Um, this points out a central fact that I, as an immigration lawyer, know and other immigration practitioners know, that Immigration and Nationality Act is a mess. It's, it's contradictory, you know, it's got this enforcement stuff, but then it's got benefits that are supposed to be granted to people who are here unlawfully. Uh, it, as a technical matter, the code is indeed a maze. Uh, King Minos is labyrinth in ancient Crete, as one federal court once said. What immigration practitioners are experiencing today because of this perfect storm of bad politics, Congress not being able to solve the problem, a code that, that's messy is chaos, confusion, gaps in the law, and inability of millions of people to gain any legal status anymore, even though 100 years ago they easily would have been able to get green cards. Uh, today, even people who are married to American citizens and are otherwise perfectly law-abiding except for immigration violations are not eligible to get any legal status. Um, our immigration system, our legal system is broken. We've got backlogs, we've got quotas, we've got rules that don't make any sense, and we have a lot of things in the code that are undermining our national security. Um, of course, we, we've got the headlines today with the crisis of the unaccompanied minors on the southern border, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, what is absolutely true, though, is something that's contrary to a lot of the headlines. The code is chock full of legal authorities that are given to the executive branch. There are piles of provisions in the code that mention the president having authority, that mention the attorney general having authority, that mention the secretary of homeland security having authority. Uh, those of you in the audience who are national security lawyers will be well familiar with the famous Justice Jackson Youngstown test, uh, which applies in situations like this. And of course, Justice Jackson opinion, uh, Justice Jackson's opinion uh, takes a flexible approach to the issue of presidential power, rejecting any fixed boundary between Congress and the president. Um, I, I think it would be helpful in today's news media when people talk about presidential power to remind them about the Youngstown test because J Jackson divided presidential authority into three categories in descending order of legitimacy, saying, of course, first, there are the most legitimate cases, the cases in which the president is acting with express or implied authority from Congress. And side note, 
there's tons of that uh, express or implied authority for what the administration wants to do today in the code. The second category, cases in which Congress has been silent, and then the third category, cases in which the president is defying congressional orders, the, the third category. Now, just to mention a few specific authorities that the president has to deal with immigration, uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act has Section 207 in it, and I'll just quote from it. If the president determines after appropriate consultation that an unforeseen emergency refugee situation exists, the admission of certain refugees in response to the emergency refugee situation is justified by grave humanitarian concerns or is otherwise in the national interest. And the admission to the United States of these refugees cannot be accomplished under subsection A. The president may fix the number of refugees to be admitted to the United States during the succeeding period, not to exceed 12 months in response to the emergency refugee situation and so forth and so on. So that's just one section of the code, but it gives the president explicit statutory authority. It puts him in tier one of the Youngstown test to do certain things on his own um, to deal with this kind of crisis. And there are further authorities. Section 212D5 of the Immigration Code gives the president the authority to parole people into the United States. It's not criminal parole, immigration parole. We call it humanitarian parole. Margaret Stock. Them a sort of quasi-legal status. That's an authority that has been used for decades by presidents to bring people into the United States who otherwise can't qualify for a visa. Uh, Shoba mentioned 242, INA section 242, that prevents judicial review of decisions of the president to use these authorities. It's rather interesting. INA section 274A, giving the president uh, through the Attorney General and the Secretary of Homeland Security the authority to issue work permits to people. Anybody that they decide they want to issue a work permit to, they simply have to publish in the Federal Register that folks are going to be able to get work permits, and they're given that explicit statutory authority. I'm only mentioning a few of these, but again, the code is just chock full of these authorities, and it's been unfortunate in the news coverage that, for the most part, um, these statements are being made that there's no authority to do different things, and in fact, you know, if you go look in the code, you can find it quite easily. People also say that there's no authority for categorical grants of, of relief. Uh, in fact, it's one of the most open secrets among immigration lawyers in America today that that's simply not true. There's plenty of categorical authority. The classic example of this is an exercise, uh, authority that's long been exercised, the parole authority. Um, presidents, many presidents, have repeatedly affirmed the executive branch's authority to give categorical relief and the example I give is the Cubans. Uh, Cubans who are found to have entered the United States unlawfully are immediately given parole and work permits for free by the U.S. government. This has been going on for decades. Um, there hasn't been any big outcry about it. And the reason that they're given this parole is so that they can then qualify to adjust their status and get green cards under the Cuban Adjustment Act because if they weren't given the parole, they would be ineligible to adjust their status under the Cuban Adjustment Act. Uh, this has been going on literally for decades. There are numerous memos discussing this authority, and it's purely categorical. That's just one obviously bald example, uh, but there are other ones. Um, and there has been, again, no outcry. Another relevant recent example is from the Bush administration. This occurred under Secretary of Homeland Security Michael Chertoff. Uh, in 2007, it came to the attention of Secretary Chertoff that there was a problem with certain military family members who could not get legal status. The situation came to his attention because there was an Army soldier who went missing in action in Iraq. And while he was missing in action, the government of the United States was trying to deport his wife. And of course, he couldn't appear at the deportation hearing because he was missing in action in Iraq. And so Secretary Chertoff ordered the parole of the wife, and that allowed her to get a green card under regular legal authorities that exist, uh, similar to the Cuban Adjustment Act. So Secretary Chertoff did this, and that started a, a formal program that has now been uh, solidified in a memo uh, to allow military family members to be treated like Cubans. So that for several years now, military family members who are the immediate relatives the immediate relatives of military family members have been granted a parole that then allows them to adjust their status under existing congressional statutes and they can therefore get green cards. They don't have to leave the United States in order to get their green cards. They're treated like Cubans. Another example, and the one I will more or less finish up on, is the MAVNI program, Military Accessions Vital to the National Interest. This is a program for which I was recognized by the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, there's a statute 
that allows the president through the secretaries of the services. Um, when you listed earlier, Jill, you listed all the agencies that have something to do with immigration. You didn't mention the Department of Defense. No, but yeah. among the many agencies that has um, immigration authority is actually the Department of Defense because they can enlist people into the military through existing Title X authorities and then through Title VIII authorities that allow for rapid naturalization, they can turn the people who are enlisted into the military into citizens. This is not any new authority. In World War I, about 20% of the soldiers in the army were immigrants, many of them right off the boat. They were drafted and they were turned into American citizens. Um, that, that happened also in World War II, in the Korean War, in the Vietnam War. Uh, it was required in some sense by international law because if you want people to be fighting for you and you're, you've declared war against Germany, it's very difficult to claim that Germans who are living in the United States that you want to draft um, should be serving in your armed forces unless you turn them into American citizens and then you eliminate a lot of the technical legal problems that you have of having foreign nationals working for you in a, in a declared conflict. Uh, so we've had a long history in America of recruiting immigrants. Interestingly, after 9-11, immigrant participation in the military had dropped to its lowest level ever historically and that's still the case today. Why had that happened? Because our immigration system is broken and the Department of Defense had imposed a requirement, self-imposed a requirement that you have to have a green card to join the military but nobody could get a green card anymore. You know we had millions of people living in the U.S. legally for years and years and years who had H-1B visas and J visas and F visas and so forth, but they could never get a green card because the quotas and the backlogs were really crazy. So you'd have a young man, for example, who was going to MIT and getting a master's degree in some field that is of great relevance to national security, but once he graduates, he has to get OPT and then H-1B and then go through a perm process, and by the time he gets a green card, he's 35, and he's too old to join the military, or even 40 if he's Chinese or Indian, uh, because that's how long it's taking to, uh, to get people green cards and of course to join the military if you're going to have to have a green card and you're too old you know that that ends up being a problem so under the bush administration we started the mavni program using existing statutory authority we didn't have to go get any congressional changes to the law uh, 10 united states code 504b gives the service secretaries the authority to list people enlist people who are vital to the national interest and then those people can get citizenship under existing naturalization laws so we started enlisting only people who were legal although the administration had authority to enlist undocumented immigrants there's nothing to prevent that in the law but the administration chose to enlist people who were legally present in the united states because those folks had a record with homeland security could have their security status verified and so forth uh, and we allowed those individuals to join the united states military um, and this turned out to be an incredibly successful program because the legal immigration system is broken so doctors, highly educated people with PhDs, and master's degrees and so forth, flooded army recruiting stations trying to enlist in the military. And I gave you the example of the MIT person, that's a real case, uh, an individual from a country that was going to be backlogged, was getting, he was actually getting a PhD from MIT, but he realized that he wasn't going to get a green card or US citizenship until he was about 40 years old. So he dropped out of his MIT PhD program and join the United States Army as a specialist. Um, you know, kind of pretty dropping down the educational level there if you're familiar with the military rank system. Knowing that if he joined the Army, he would get American citizenship and then he would be able to use his degree, possibly get a commission as an officer later on. Um, this program was wildly successful. It gave us the U.S. Army Soldier of the Year for 2012, the winner of the Marine Corps Marathon, a legal immigrant from Kenya who happened to be, you know, attending a school Crimson Tide as an NCAA All-American athlete. Um, lots of folks like that. But it was only successful because the legal immigration system is broken, which is rather, rather ironic. So we have a system today that doesn't serve our national security. Uh, you know, you hear people saying we must enforce the law in order to help our national security. And my perspective on that is it's actually a little bit backward. Our legal immigration system is so broken now that we cannot get the resources into America that we need to sustain our national security. If you look at national security from a broad perspective, you look at economic security and you look at the needs of the military. Uh, if we went back to the historical practice of being generous with green cards, it would enhance our national security because it would give the military a much larger pool of really talented recruits to draw on. 
and we don't have that right now. Uh, there has been bipartisan support. We mentioned dysfunction in Congress, but one thing the um, House Republicans have been strong on is using the immigration system to help um, the military with recruiting. And a House Tea Party member has introduced a bill to make that MAVNI program that I mentioned permanent. Let me turn at the end, though, here to the crisis on the border with the children. Um, I think there's been a lot of bad information in the news about this crisis. For one thing, it's not new. It's a crisis that immigration practitioners know has been building for a really long time. Uh, it's a crisis partially caused by the heavy enforcement of the past 10 years. I'd only mention a foreign affairs article that would interest you if you're interested in this, How the Gangs Took Central America, a 2005 article in Foreign Affairs, which talks about how U.S. mass deportations to Central America have destabilized Central America and created a national security problem that the recent, uh, the new commander of Southcom, General Kelly, has acknowledged has been partially caused by our deportation policies. The legal authorities do exist to deal with this crisis in a humanitarian fashion, although so far that has not quite happened. Uh, the administration's response to the crisis has not really been in line with traditional notions of due process. This fast tracking of deportations has in resulted in some very unfortunate headlines. Um, today I got this article, five children murdered after they were deported back to Honduras. And this is pretty typical of what people were expecting would happen with um, you know, short, short circuiting the due process and not letting people apply for asylum as they normally would. I am hoping that this crisis on the southern border will be looked at holistically and not just as a problem of, of children who need to be sent back as fast as possible, but that Congress and the President will look at the underlying social and economic factors that are feeding the crisis, because if we don't solve those, we're not going to really help our national security. Um, one of the underlying factors is a legal immigration system that doesn't meet our needs. And there are ways the executive may act lawfully, plenty of ways, to alleviate these problems. They're in line with Youngstown. The president would be in tier one if he did them. And I hope to see that happening in the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Margaret Stock is an immigration and citizen law, a citizenship law attorney. She took part in this conversation on immigration law and executive power that was part of the American Bar Association's Homeland Security Law Institute's annual conference here in Washington, D.C. This is C-SPAN Radio. Margaret um, and Marshall and Shoba, those were wonderful comments. We do have some time for questions. If there are any questions, uh, you can come up to the microphone. Um, I'll start. A qu I have a question. Jill F Family is the director of the Law and Government Institute at Widener University. Get things started. And really, I think um, any one of the three of you could answer this. And that is, if we do see some additional executive action um, coming from the Obama administration, just to be clear, I mean, what will it be? Is it go, you think it'll be a benefit that individuals could apply for? Um, what exactly might the benefit be? I mean, I just want to make sure we're clear on, on what exactly we're talking about in terms of the actual end product or result of a further executive action. Shoba Wadia. All right, so um, just one clarifying point that most forms, or rather all forms of prosecutorial discretion are not deemed to be a benefit in the eyes of the agency, though they are certainly a de facto benefit to the individual, especially if, for example, they have the ability to apply for a work permit if they have deferred action or a supervision order, or if they have the ability to apply for a driver's license. Um, one form that we, we could see is deferred action, right, which would be something like DACA aimed at um, a particular group of individuals. Um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, what it should look like, and then maybe Marshall can share more insights on what he thinks it will look like, um, is, is here we have... Um, the opportunity for really good administrative law function, right? A form, a fee, a process. 
These procedural ingredients were part of the DACA program, and that's part of what made it a success. Um, but there were also some costs to that transparency, right, including a lawsuit and legislation to freeze um, authority. Um, but, you know, I'd like any program that does come out to include these, um, you know, basic ingredients to ensure things like consistency in the outcome of cases so that people with similarly relevant facts end up with the same outcome, for example. Well, I'm not going to speculate as to what it might be, but um, I do think that Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA, provides a good um, template for the administration as they are trying to prioritize their use of enforcement resources. I did want to just build on, though, this notion of it's seen, I think, unfortunately, um, just because the nature of the public debate is is uh, s sadly misinformed often, um, that this is viewed just simply as a benefit for the individuals. Um, I think Margaret can speak to this, and I've learned this from her over the years. Um, uh, but you know, this is an inf if, if say they were to decide people who've been here 10 years are eligible to come forward and request the exercise of discretion. They're going to have to go through background checks. They're going to have to, um, uh, you know, identify themselves. Um, the, the mere process of identifying someone who has lived here for 10 years and who is unknown to the government um, provides a very important and powerful national security benefit. Uh, Marshall Fitz. Obviously, uh, five percent of the workforce is unknown to the to the current uh, government officials. That is a, a security risk, and so just the process of getting people to come forward and register um, is a, a benefit to, to all of us in, in terms of our collective national security. Uh, there are also um, pretty significant ancillary um, economic benefits to the tax uh, revenue base. We're, we'll be coming out with a report in a couple of weeks that highlights how extensive that is, but, um, but just kind of in line with this national security point, I think it's really important to know that um, you know, this is not so much about, um, and the, the process of fixing the system System through executive action is not so much about providing a benefit to an individual as it is um, trying to rationalize and, and make more uh, functional what is, um, you know, sadly a, a grossly currently dysfunctional system. Uh, I have no idea what the administration is planning to do. Just I've heard the rumors that everybody else has heard as well. But one of the things I'm hoping is that they'll look at the currently artificial barriers that prevent people from getting legal status under current law. We've built up this extraordinarily complicated legal regime that allows certain laws to sit on the books, for example, that say you can get a green card if you're married to an American citizen, but then we put all these gates in the way to prevent people from doing that. And the example I gave of the Cubans is a good one. Congress passed the Cuban Adjustment Act, but it said, you know, you, to adjust your status under this act, you have to be paroled, mm -hmm. okay? so. How did the executive deal with this congressional mandate when there are all these Cubans in the country who came in unlawfully? They snuck in. Um, the executive gave them parole so that they could then use the existing law. They wouldn't have to go back to Cuba uh, in order to, to get their status that Congress asked them to, you know, said that they could get. Um, the executive has the authority right now to fix a lot of arbitrary barriers that are preventing the spouses of American citizens from getting green cards. The statute says they can get a green card, but they have to be admitted or paroled. So you could expand the parole authority to people that are similarly situated to Cubans. You know, maybe they come from a country where there's unrest. We don't want to send them back to uh, Liberia where there's an Ebola breakout if they're married to an American citizen. We don't want to send them to Liberia to get their visa, so why don't we just parole them so that they can then, you know, adjust their status under the existing law. I don't think too many people would argue with this if you explain it to them. But the technicalities of the code are such that it's very difficult in a 30-second soundbite with a you know, reporter to explain to the public that our legal immigration system doesn't let people get status today. And that's the one of the reasons why we have this 8 to 20 million population of people running around with, with no papers, many of whom are married to Americans or you know, have substantial ties to the United States. Okay, it looks like we have a question from the audience. My name's Sheila Worth, and I used to be a prosecutor, and now I work on, for DOD on rule of law programs. Um, yesterday, I asked the law enforcement panel about that, uh, the effects of deporting felons and how um, that what 
uh, effect that have, has had on fragile countries, um, creation of crime problems, and then export ex obviously the um, children um, leave, fleeing the country in order to avoid uh, gang involvement. They, the uh, panel didn't want to comment on that, but uh, he did say that they had been creating some programs to try and mitigate the effect uh, on fragile countries for the deportation of felons. Can you comment on that? Do you know whether they've, there's been some developments? Yeah, there have been some or? developments. The problem is creating programs like this, it, it takes a lot of resources and a lot of effort. And I'll, I'll just play out the scenario, okay? You are a Central American gang like Mara Salvatrucha 13, okay, MS-13, very infamous gang. Um, to be a gang, you, you need to have your human resources department, you know, you need your recruits, right? Um, MS-13 for years was finding a viable source of recruits were U.S. deportation flights from the United States because the United States was deporting people back to Central America, often young people who had lived in the United States for years and years and years. They knew America really well, but they didn't know anything about El Salvador, even though technically they were El Salvadoran. And they would get dropped in San Salvador with no money, no social support network, nobody to meet them there at the airport to say, come on, here's a job, you know, here's some productive things you can do with your life. And MS-13 quickly figured out that a great way to get recruits would be to meet the deportation flights. I mean, you can imagine the scenario. And to offer a place to live and food and a social support network. But oh, by the way, you now get to run some drugs back into the United States, which you want to be, you want to be in the United States anyway. That's really your home. You know, you're now going to work for us. Um, and I think the U.S. was very slow to recognize that we were actually fostering the development of MS-13 with a lot of our policies. So what they're trying to do now is to try to come up with programs in this, the receiving countries so that people who get deported back are just not, you know, sort of left to the depredations of these gangs that are trying to recruit people off the flights. But we've had problems with, you know, Jamaica, the Jamaican government complaining that we're deporting essentially U.S. educated criminals back to Jamaica. You know, and, and the interesting thing about it is these folks weren't criminals when they got to the United States originally. They kind of learned a lot of their criminality by inter interfacing in our cities or interfacing with our gangs or being in our prison system. You know, the stuff sort of got learned in America and the techniques of criminality were honed in America. And then these folks are then deported back to a place like Jamaica or Honduras or El Salvador or um, Guatemala with these networks already built and the receiving country doesn't have the capacity to deal with it. So they are starting to develop these programs, but I wouldn't say they're full-fledged or capable of dealing with the problem. I mean, all you have to do is look at this headline I mentioned. You know, the government was assuring people that when they deported these kids back, that the kids would be safe when they got deported back. And already we've seen kids getting murdered after having been deported, fast track deportation back to Central America. So it is true that they are developing the programs, but I wouldn't say that they're fully operational or effective at the moment. I understand on the last point that they're in, in Guatemala. There are they're making there's there's a limited program in effect, very limited in El Salvador and Honduras. There's nothing. I mean, they're they're getting off the plane and being greeted with nothing, no no opportunity. I mean, there's some lip service to you know what they want to stand up going forward, but right now. There, there's absolutely no infrastructure to receive these these folks and try to make them more productive. I mean, and, and, and again, it's not only the people who are being returned, but this is one of the problems in those three countries is that there there is so little infrastructure um, to protect um, them and provide them with opportunity that uh, it's a it's really a vicious cycle. I think we have time for one more question. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Heidi Myers. I'm a private attorney, and my question is for Margaret Stock. Um, I was wondering, for uh, those granted DACA, just in general, people granted DACA, uh, young people granted DACA, and, in, and also the subset of those granted DACA who, who have outstanding removal orders or are in removal proceedings, would they be eligible for this program that allows for enlistment into the military and obtaining citizenship and if they're not currently eligible are there any plans to broaden the category of those who are eligible so that they could uh, you know these young dream dreamers could 
enter the military and gain their citizenship? Thanks for that question. It's one I get asked a lot. Uh, currently, the administration policy is not to allow the DACAs to enlist in the military. Uh, this could be changed quite easily with a one-page memo. Um, Chuck Hagel simply has to sign a memo saying that people who've been granted, who've cleared all the security checks for DACA and have the work permit and the social security number are allowed to enlist in the military. So far, Secretary Hagel has not exercised that authority, even though he has that statutory authority to do that. DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It's the executive order allowing certain young undocumented immigrants a two-year reprieve from deportation. Uh, there is a bill that's pending in Congress uh, that was introduced by a House Republican that would allow the DACAs to enlist in the military. Um, I should mention there's actually two bills. Uh, there's one called the Enlist Act, which I do not support. Uh, the Enlist Act would let people who have no documents enlist in the military. I think that's a really bad idea to let people who are completely undocumented and have no Homeland Security record and haven't cleared Homeland Security checks enlist in the military. So I don't support the Enlist Act, even though it's got a cool name. Um, but the bill that's a good one is the Military Enlistment Opportunity Act of 2013, which was introduced by Tea Party Republican Mike Kaufman of Colorado. That allows people to enlist in the military if they have a DACA employment authorization document, which you as a practitioner know means that they've cleared all these terrorism checks. They've got their biometrics taken. You know, Homeland Security's run them through the gang member database and the terrorism database. And, you know, they have no criminal record that's serious. You know, they might have some parking tickets or something, but they don't have a serious criminal record. That Margaret Stock. Population is a very safe population to allow to enlist in the military because they've been in the United States at least five years. They have a high school diploma. They've cleared all these DHS security checks. They have a file with DHS. They have a Social Security number. You know, they're very, very high quality source of recruits. And it's a little known fact out there that the military has a huge demographic time bomb happening right now where it's very difficult to find qualified American citizen recruits for a number of reasons. Only about um, one out of five Americans of military age can qualify for the military right now due to factors like obesity, drug use, um, all kinds of you know, disqualifying issues, health issues. Uh, lack of education and so forth. So the Pentagon numbers are really scary right now for the future of the all-volunteer force because of a lack of qualified recruits within the population pool, our ap rapidly rate aging population and you know, increasing youth disqualification for military service. If you opened up the pool to that group of people, the doctors who have been given work permission, you add um, a few hundred thousand people to the pool of potential recruits and they're U.S. educated and you know, a low, a low risk population for recruitment. But so far, the president has not chosen to ac exercise the authority he already has to allow those folks to enlist. As I said, the Bush administration was the one that got the Mavni program started, not the Obama administration. And I, I suspect that uh, maybe President Bush would have been less reluctant to exercise executive authority than the current administration has been. Thank you very much. Um, that's all the time that we have. Please join me in thanking our three panelists. And thank you for joining us today. Jill Family moderated this conversation on immigration law and executive power. She is the director of the Law and Government Institute at Widener University. The panelists were Marshall Fitz, immigration policy director at the Center for American Progress, Margaret Stock, an, an immigration and citizenship law attorney, and Shoba Wadia, a law professor at Penn State University and founder and director of the Center for Immigrants' Rights. You're listening to C-SPAN Radio coming up at the top of the hour, 6 p.m. here on the East Coast. It's Newsmakers, our guest this week, uh, Indiana Governor Mike Pence. In the weekly media addresses yesterday, President Obama called on Congress to extend the charter of the Export-Import Bank. And for the Republicans, Reince Priebus, chair of the Republican National Committee, asked voters to elect members of the GOP in November. Hi, everybody. Nearly six years after the worst financial crisis of our lifetimes, our businesses have added nearly 10 million new jobs over the past 53 months. That's the longest streak of private sector job creation in our history. And we're in a six-month streak with our economy creating at least 200,000 new jobs each month, the first time that's happened since 1997. Thanks to the decisions we made to rescue and rebuild our economy and your hard work and resilience, America's leading again. Areas like manufacturing, energy, technology, and autos are all booming. 
And here's the thing. We're selling more goods made in America to the rest of the world than ever before. American exports are at an all-time high. Over the past five years, we've worked hard to open new markets for our businesses and to help them compete on a level playing field in those markets. And we've broken records for exports four years running. Last year, our exports supported more than 11 million American jobs, about 1.6 million more than when I took office. They're good jobs that typically pay about 15% more than the national average. And more small businesses are selling their goods abroad than ever before, nearly 300,000 last year alone. We should be doing everything we can to accelerate this progress, not stall it. One place to start is by supporting something called the U.S. Export-Import Bank. Its sole mission is to create American jobs. That's it. It helps many American entrepreneurs take that next step and take their small business global. But next month, its charter will expire unless members of Congress do their job and reauthorize it. Now, past Congresses have done this 16 times, always with support from both parties. Republican and Democratic presidents have supported the bank, too. This time around shouldn't be any different, because the bank works. It's independent. It pays for itself. But if Congress fails to act, thousands of businesses, large and small, that sell their products abroad will take a completely unnecessary hit. Small business owners have had to overcome a lot these past several years. We all saw local businesses close their doors during the crisis. And in the past few years, we've seen more and more open their doors and do their part to help lead America's comeback. At the very least, they deserve a Congress that doesn't stand in the way of their success. Your members of Congress are home this month. If you're a small business owner or an employee at a large business that depends on financing to tackle new markets and create new jobs, tell them to quit treating your business like it's expendable and start treating it for what it is, vital to America's success. Tell them to do their jobs, keep America's exports growing, and keep America's recovery going. Thanks, and have a great weekend. Hi, I'm Reince Priebus, Chairman of the Republican National Committee. Here in my office at the RNC, I keep a couple pictures on my desk, photos of my two kids, Jack and Grace. It's to remind me why I come to work in the morning, to help elect leaders who will secure a better future for all of our kids. And if you have kids, you know what I mean when I say, I want them to have every opportunity I had growing up in America and more. We all want our kids to have it better than we did. And that's why so many people I talk to are frustrated about what we've seen happening under President Obama's leadership. For over five years, he's failed to get government spending down to a reasonable level. And I just don't think it's fair for the next generation to have to pay the bills of this generation. This month, President Obama has been on vacation. He attended his 401st fundraiser. He's now played over 190 rounds of golf as president. Now, we all deserve some time off. But you have to wonder, where are his priorities? We all watch the news. We see what's happening overseas in places like Iraq and Syria and Ukraine. We see the tensions at home in Missouri, and we lost a young American journalist at the hands of fanatical terrorists. And yet, President Obama is on vacation. Now, he did fly back to Washington briefly this past week, but I think many observers got it right when they called it a photo op. He spent about a million in taxpayer dollars to fly back from Martha's Vineyard on Air Force One to take a few pictures. Then it was back to vacationing in the golf course. Our country deserves better, and Republicans offer a better way. In the last 18 months, the House of Representatives, which is run by Republicans, has passed hundreds of bills to improve the lives of Americans. The sad part is, over 350 of those bills, including 43 jobs bills, are stuck in the Democrat-controlled U.S. Senate. Harry Reid and his fellow Democrats are standing in the way of progress, and President Obama has other priorities. Thankfully, we have a chance to change things up in November. By winning just six more seats, we can elect a Republican majority to the U.S. Senate. And I can promise you this. When Republicans lead both houses of Congress, our priorities will be clear. Spending less, making energy more affordable, improving education for kids 
reforming health care to give you flexibility and lower costs, meeting the daily concerns of middle class Americans. But our top priority will be the same reason so many of us go to work every single day. Our kids' future. It's priority number one. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And God bless America. The weekly media addresses we heard first from President Obama, followed by Reince Priebus, chair of the Republican National Committee. You're listening to C-SPAN Radio WCSPFM Washington. You can find us streaming live on the web at cspan.org. We are on XM Satellite Radio Channel 119. And you can also download our free app for your smartphone or tablet. Now, at the top of the hour, 6 p.m. here on the East Coast, it's time for Newsmakers. This week on Newsmakers, joining us from Indianapolis, the Republican Governor, Mike Pence. Thank you, sir, for being with us on Newsmakers. You bet, Greta. Thank you. In studio with us, we have Robert Costa of the Washington Post, national politics reporter, and Reed Epstein, who is the national political reporter with the Wall Street Journal. Robert, I turn to you for the first question. Governor, thanks for being here. You've been mentioned as a possible 2016 presidential contender. Uh, Give me an assessment of how you see the emerging Republican field. Well, I think uh, the Republican Party, as as we look forward into this fall's elections and and beyond, has a very deep bench and. you know, I'm I'm always very uh, uh, very humbled uh, to be mentioned among uh, a long list of uh, very accomplished uh, men and women in our party who I think are part of a rising generation of leadership. I want to say particularly at the state level. In, in my uh, Bob, you know, I served uh, 12 years uh, there on Capitol Hill. I've uh, served about a year and a half as governor of the state of Indiana, and I'm more convinced than ever that the cure for what ails this country will come more from our nation's state capitals uh, than it ever will from our nation's capital. And uh, Republican governors across the country in 29 Republican-led states, I hope more Republican-led states after this fall's election are really leading the way with uh, with, uh, the kind of results that are demonstrating that when you put these common sense Republican principles into practice, uh, it all works. So I'm I'm very optimistic about the future. Um, obviously, very very humbled and grateful to be among a company of so many accomplished uh, men and women in our party across the country. And uh, uh, I like our chances, Governor. Given how unpopular uh, Congress is and the approval ratings, would it be a mistake for the party to nominate uh, someone who's in Washington now as its uh, standard bearer in 2016? Well, Reed, I think it would. I think it would be a mistake for our party to continue to look to Washington D.C. as the place where we're going to solve uh, many of the intractable problems uh, facing our country. I, I think it's less about where that leadership emerges from than than it is about about the focus. You know, I I, I really think to some extent uh, our party in the last uh, uh, quarter century has become as Washington centric. Uh, as the Democratic Party, uh, and uh, in my in my short tenure here as governor of the state of Indiana, and as I observe other Republican governors around the country and the results that they've produced, uh, my message uh, to our party, my message to uh, policy leaders on Capitol Hill, uh, is, is very simple, and that is that uh, when Republicans regain the Senate uh, this fall, and when Republicans uh, regain the White House in 2016, it it will not be enough simply to cut government spending in Washington. I I think it's incumbent on our party uh, to promote policies that will permanently reduce the size and scope of the federal government and restore to the states the resources and the flexibility to solve problems for the people of their own jurisdictions. I I really believe in areas from education uh, to health care to transportation. States are simply better equipped. Uh, to develop innovative solutions uh, for uh, uh, for the challenges that our nation is facing. So uh, uh, to respond, uh, Reid, I would say it's, it's not so much about where that leadership uh, comes from, uh, but uh, my hope is that our party, being the Republican Party, a party that uh, that truly believes uh, in the that constitutional framework of uh, the 10th Amendment and beyond will again look to the states as those laboratories of innovation and return and restore resources and power to the states as part of of uh, the way forward. Governor, looming over all of this discussion of 2016, it's former Secretary of State 
Hillary Clinton, the probable Democratic frontrunner, should she choose to run? What are her strengths? What are her weaknesses? How do Republicans beat Clinton if she gets in the race? <laughs> Well, I'll be I'll be reading you very intently, Bob, to find out. I, I, I'm just, let's get your answer. What's your take on Clinton, Governor? Well, look, you know, I I've, um, I have uh, uh, had the occasion to um, work in and around uh, 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 Secretary Clinton for many years. She's obviously uh, uh, an immense political talent. But I, I will tell you, I I, I think it's uh, the American people are. Are, are less interested in in public men and women talking about what's wrong with the other side as they are in talking about what's right about their side and you know my hope is that uh, in this fall's elections and uh, in any future elections our party will will uh, put out a positive substantive uh, agenda of uh, of solutions grounded in republican principles and i i think i think that's what will carry the day more than uh, uh, criticisms or comparisons uh, with the competition, whoever that might be. So, speaking of, of sort of issues that are going to carry the day, both this this fall and in 2016, uh, after the 2012 election, a lot of there was a lot of discussion in Republican circles about what to do about immigration and how to appeal more to uh, the growing Hispanic population in the country. Uh, just in the last in the last few weeks, Republicans voted to rescind. President Obama's DACA program. Is that something that if you were still in the House, would you have voted for that? Do you think it was a good idea to take that vote in the House? Well, you know, I've got my hands full here uh, uh, in Indiana, and so I'll, I'll stay focused on, on Indiana policy. And, and but is that, is, that avoid, an, is that something that you would vote, uh, you would support? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'll avoid uh, hypotheticals about uh, a job I used to have, but I will tell you, Reed. I think I think you you've known me long enough to know. You know, I I waded into this debate uh, in 2006 uh, when I was chairman of the House Conservative Caucus. I, I worked with uh, then Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison uh, to craft what I thought was a, a principled. Uh, no amnesty, uh, 21st century guest worker program that frankly had uh, an awful lot of people uh, in uh, uh, at, at every end of the spectrum uh, very intrigued. And I, to this day, I, I still believe uh, that uh, by saying uh, uh, no to amnesty, uh, by making a strong commitment to border security, uh, that there is a way that we could, working with private sector firms in this country, create a 21st century guest worker program. Program. I, I proposed it uh, uh, eight years ago. Uh, I still believe that it's an idea whose time uh, will come. I, I, I think that uh, Ronald Reagan was right when he said a nation without borders is, is not a nation. We have to commit ourselves to border security. Uh, we have to commit ourselves to enforcing the rule of law. But as this economy continues to get back on its feet, I, I really do believe that part of the long-term solution uh, is a modern uh, uh, 21st century guest worker program that could uh, operate as a public and private partnership uh, between the, the federal government and many uh, private placement firms. And uh, uh, that's a plan that I, I believe that someday we will return to. And I think it, it reflects the American people's commitment to the rule of law and also uh, a commitment to creating a, a system that, uh, that that honors those who would like to come into our country temporarily, uh, make a contribution to our economy, and return home. You said no amnesty. What does that mean? Does that mean no uh, no path to citizenship, no path to legal status for people who are here uh, un illegally? I've just I just always believe that we should uh, uh, we should not uh, uh, reward people with citizenship whose first act in this country was a violation of the law uh... and uh... and i, I continue to hold that view uh, but but let me say I, I think there's there's plenty of room here uh... for compassion and there's plenty of room here uh... for uh, for crafting uh, a solution that'll deal with this issue in the long term i i i will tell you the looking back uh... even though uh, i remember when i made this proposal read uh, I think it was Ruben Navarrete who wrote uh, 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 a favorable column about it. And when our own uh, hometown newspaper, the Indianapolis Star, endorsed it, they said, when you're being equally uh, uh, criticized by the hard right and the hard left, you might actually be onto something. Uh, and, and I think we were. I still think we are. That 
uh, you know, when President Bush there said there had to be a rational middle ground uh, between mass deportation and amnesty, I, I think we came pretty close to finding it. Uh, and that is, again, uh, commit to uh, setting amnesty aside, commit to strong border security and internal enforcement. But then uh, I think as we do those things, I think there would be room uh, to deal with the future needs of the country by creating a rational uh, 21st century guest worker program in partnership with employment placement firms. And, uh, and that creating a, a legal avenue for people to visit our country, participate in our economy, and to be able to return to their own country under the color of the law that would allow our border security personnel to really focus on those uh, who are attempting and would, would always attempt to come into our country outside the law. Indiana Governor Mike Pence, our guest this week on Newsmakers on C-SPAN Radio. The reporters are Robert Costa of the Washington Post, Reed Epstein of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Governor, you've, you've often defined yourself as a so-called Jack Kemp Republican. Uh, and as you look toward the midterms, perhaps toward 2016, how do Republicans, and yourself in particular, address the growing divide between the rich and the poor? Do you really take a different, do you have to take a different position on the minimum wage? Uh, do you have to have a real anti-poverty plan? What's the answer for Republicans on these kind of issues? Well, I, I, I appreciate you mentioning Jack Kemp. Uh, not only was he uh, a hero of mine when I, I first sought public office in the 1980s, but uh, uh, Jack uh, uh, and Joanne became very dear friends uh, of, of, uh, of Karen and mine in the years that I served in the same role in the Congress that he served. He was House Conference Chairman. Uh, he would become a close mentor and friend until his untimely death. And, uh, and, and I said, uh, I said, after he passed, that uh, the debt, uh, the debt uh, that our party owes to Jack Kemp can only be repaid by relentless imitation of his example, and, and his example, Bob, as you, as you know, was uh, really grounded in the very founding of the Republican Party. Our our, our party was founded uh, by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and others on the simple principle of equality of opportunity. And Jack Kemp understood that. Uh, he knew that uh, the message of, of a society where there was opportunity for all uh, to, to create the kind of um, uh, economic policies that would open up the American dream for every, uh, every American uh, knew no boundaries. And, and uh, I, I think the key going forward for us is not about changing policies, uh, but it's about changing the way that we communicate those policies and the way that we um, uh, the way that we're willing to carry those policies uh, into every community uh, in this country I mean everybody longs for the American dream uh, my grandfather came to this country got off a boat onto Ellis Island and moved to Chicago my dad helped build a small gas station business in southern Indiana I mean I mean we all long for that and and uh, Jack understood that I think at the core of our party the pathway forward is not about it's not about what offering what the other party you know offers you know minus 10% it's it's about it's about offering a positive optimistic solution that says uh, american prosperity is available for everyone and we want to create uh, those economic policies and conditions that that open uh, through through education through economic incentives through expanded job opportunities it it opens the american dream for for every american uh, Governor, this week a federal judge uh, rebuked you personally on, on the gay marriage issue in Indiana, uh, saying that you couldn't both say that you're not responsible for enforcing the law and issue exec orders to executive agencies in Indiana uh, related to, to same-sex marriage. Do you think that in 2016 the Republican nominee needs to be someone who is firmly opposed to, to same-sex marriage? Well, let me say I, I support traditional marriage, um, and uh, will continue to hold that view. Uh, and is it but, uh, is it possible to support traditional marriage and be open to to same sex marriage? Well, well, let me say I I, I uh, finish my comment if I may. I, I support traditional marriage, and uh, and will always hold that view. And and uh, I've, I've long believed that issues of this nature are best decided by the people and not the courts but but read uh, this is now before the courts uh, 
Um, the, the state of Indiana now is in, in the midst of uh, litigation that, that's moved its way into the Court of Appeals and will be a part of the Supreme Court's consideration of this issue. And, and uh, as I said in Evansville a couple of days ago with some constituents, um, that uh, while, while my views are what they are, I, uh, uh, I want Hoosiers to know that uh, we'll uphold the rule of law. Uh, when the lower court made their decision, uh, we, uh, we took action to implement that decision in the operation of state government. When the Court of Appeals stayed that decision, we, we took the same uh, position. And, uh, and now the Supreme Court will make this decision. And as, as one who believes in the rule of law, uh, uh, I, want my, uh, I want my constituents to know that uh, our administration uh, will uphold uh, the rule of law and respect uh, the decisions of the court going forward. But, but go uh, Governor, Reed asked you about the politics of this, and so let me make it e maybe a little more narrow. Let's say someone like Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, who supports same-sex marriage, he was the Republican nominee or the Republican vice presidential nominee. Is that a ticket that you could support, someone who supports same-sex marriage on the top of the Republican ticket? Well, I, I wouldn't, you know, I never answer questions that are hypotheticals, Bob. You know better than that. I, uh, my, you know. my point is, though, it, can the Republican Party, moving forward, be comfortable with a politician? Could you be comfortable with a politician, a leader of the party, who supports a different view than yours on marriage? Well, again, I, I, I would just tell you, I think, uh, you know, this is an issue that uh, would that it would be decided as it has been, uh, for centuries in this country by the people. Um, you know, I, I've always, as I said, I've always believed that, that, that issues of this nature that bear upon so closely on our communities and, uh, uh, and our society are, are decided by the people. But this is now before the courts. And, uh, you know, the Supreme Court of the United States at some point uh, in the foreseeable future will either decide that this is an issue that can be resolved at the state level uh, out of a respect for federalism or they'll make a different decision um, and um, uh, I just want my constituents to know that we'll, we'll uphold the rule of law in Indiana as it's uh, defined um, uh, by the Supreme Court of the United States and, uh, and we'll move forward. Uh, what about on foreign policy? You've been to Germany recently, Governor, and uh, we, we see a lot of unrest in the Middle East with ISIS in northern Iraq and in Syria. Uh, what, what should the president be doing? What would you be doing if you were in, a, in the executive office? Well, it, it is a, it's an extraordinary time um, uh, in, in global events. And I, I think it is a, it is a consequence uh, of uh, the, uh, the policies of this administration that have made withdrawal uh, from uh, Afghanistan and Iraq the primary objective of of American foreign policy. And I think that has uh, uh, sent uh, 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 the wrong message uh, to uh, to uh, the wrong elements in that part of the world and to others who are looking on with with regard to uh, uh, you know recent Russian aggression. Uh, you know when I was in uh, in Germany, I said that rather than one more. Uh, you know, one more harsh condemnation or an attempt to uh, coalesce uh, uh, Europe behind some tepid sanctions. Uh, what we ought to be doing is passing uh, the Transatlantic uh, Trade Promotion Authority. That uh, we ought to grow stronger economically in our ties uh, uh, with Europe uh, and uh, and send a very very strong message uh, to Russia about our commitment economically to NATO and we also ought to deploy a missile defense shield to the remaining countries uh, in NATO that was suspended by this administration as well. Governor, did I... I, I do hold to the view that, that, um, that, uh, that weakness arouses evil and uh, uh, the perception of, uh, of American withdrawal, uh, the perception of America pulling back, uh, I, I truly do believe has emboldened uh, the um, uh, enemies of, of freedom, of course, uh, uh, around the world, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and it will be by communicating a stronger commitment to our allies and a, a stronger economic and military relationship in Europe uh, that will be a key forward. But with regard to Iraq, Bob, you know, uh, uh, during my years in the Congress, I traveled to Iraq and Afghanistan uh, ten different times. Uh, 
Uh, I've spent time in Mosul I've, uh, uh, to, to see the extraordinary tragedy uh, this week that took place in, in the beheading of uh, uh, that, that courageous uh, journalist, uh, uh, James Foley. Our hearts go out to his family, but the, the U.S. must respond. Uh, in a forceful way uh, to support efforts uh, to drive ISIS uh, out of Iraq. Uh, there's been a change now in the government uh, in Baghdad. Uh, the, uh, the Kurds have stepped up, uh, and it's absolutely essential that the president uh, uh, provide the kind of leadership and that uh, we provide the kind of American military support uh, that will ensure that uh, uh, the Iraq that was secured uh, by much American sacrifice Governor, does that, mean boots on the, does that mean boots on the ground, Governor? Uh, I, I, would, I would leave that to military experts uh, to decide. Uh, but uh, when you see the rise of a murderous terrorist army uh, that, as Secretary Hagel said this week, is far beyond uh, some small cell terrorist organization. This is an organized uh, uh, military effort that is on the ground that's able to move assets. I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, working with our allies uh, in Iraq, working uh, with allies uh, uh, in uh, in Europe and and, and, and across the region, uh, that uh, we come together and we find a way, uh, not just simply to focus on this atrocity this week, um, uh, but uh, that we we literally uh, we bring justice uh, to this uh, murderous army and we uh, we restore peace and stability. Uh, and uh, and territorial integrity to Iraq. Mike Pence, Republican governor of Indiana, our guest this week on Newsmakers on C-SPAN Radio. He's speaking with reporters Reed Epstein of the Wall Street Journal and Robert Costa of the Washington Post. Okay, Governor, we have about five minutes left here. Uh, governor, closer to home, uh, we've all watched the last couple of weeks what's gone on in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, do, you, do you think that there are the amount of Military, military-like assets that have been handed down to local police departments has has gone too far. Well, let me say, my, uh, uh, you know, like every American, it's uh, it's been very troubling uh, to watch the events unfurling in Ferguson, and my heart goes out uh, to the family of Michael Brown uh, in particular, and to everyone uh, in that community that's been caught up in in the turmoil of the last uh, uh, several weeks. And, uh, uh, and, and I, I would just say that um, uh, as the governor of the state of Indiana, I, I, it's not my place uh, to judge um, uh, the response by the law enforcement community um, or the state of Missouri uh, in that case. Uh, uh, until all the facts are out. Because that, I mean, wasn't, that wasn't what the question was. The, the question was, do you think that local police departments that it's excessive for local police departments to have some of these military-like uh, pieces of equipment? Well, I, I think it's important that law enforcement officers have the ability to protect themselves while they're protecting our families and our communities. Uh, and, and I know there's been a lot of focus in the media on the optics of that. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I don't want to pass judgment on uh, the decisions that were made by the local law enforcement uh, in Ferguson or, or in that county or in the state of Missouri. Uh, you know, I, think, I think it's important uh, that all of us uh, uh, keep this family and all of the affected families in prayer uh, and that we, um, uh, that, uh, that we allow uh, the, the system of justice to do its work. Uh, I, I have uh, every confidence uh, that uh, the justice system in Missouri will be able to uh, bring forward the facts uh, and determine what uh, what's required uh, uh, in this case, but I, I have to tell you, I, it's uh, you know I, my mind goes back to that date in April in 1968 uh, when uh, uh, when Bobby Kennedy was here in Indianapolis, Indiana, and it was the day that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated, and uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy announced to a, a large crowd, largely African American. Um, uh, that Dr. King had died, and he spoke words that uh, I think every American would do well uh, to read through this week. Uh, he spoke words into that moment uh, that uh, were not only historic, uh, but but they spoke to the hearts of the people of uh, of uh, of our community here in Indianapolis, and and uh, 
um, and and really uh, uh, he, he challenged everyone to to pray uh, to return home uh, and uh, uh, and all of us to find ways to to come together after difficult circumstances uh, uh, like those that had happened in '68, Governor, that which had beset his family and and that which has beset. Uh, of Ferguson. Governor, I'll, I'll end where I began on politics. A lot of ambitious Republicans are hitting the campaign trail this fall, helping out in Senate and gubernatorial races. Can we expect you to travel around the country to help out Republican candidates? And maybe will you help out a gubernatorial race in Iowa, Terry Branstead, and a Senate race in New Hampshire, Scott Brown? <laughs> well, uh, Bob, I've been doing that. Uh, you know, I've been, uh, I'm delighted to be a part of the Republican Governor Association. We've got some fantastic uh, candidates running for re-election and election around the country. And uh, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as we move into full-scale election season after Labor Day, uh, to the extent my duties here in, in Indiana uh, allow me to do it, uh, you bet. I'm going to be traveling around the country. I'm going to be telling the Republican story and supporting these great men and women, particularly at the state level, who are demonstrating that when you put these common sense Republican principles into practice, it all still works. In the state of Indiana, the job creation we're seeing here, the progress in education are all a result uh, of the fact that we've been, we've been putting these principles into practice and it's making a difference uh, in the lives of uh, the people of our state, the economic opportunities and the opportunities for our kids in schools. And uh, I love telling that story and I love seeing that story expand around America. Governor Mike Pence, Republican of Indiana, thank you for being our newsmaker. Thank you. The reporters this week on Newsmakers on C-SPAN Radio, Reed Epstein, national political reporter for the Wall Street Journal, and Robert Costa of the Washington Post. Let me turn back to our reporters here. So, Governor Mike Pence, a contender for 2016. What's, what, are his, what are his chances, Robert Costa? I think they're better than a lot of people realize. He's floating at the fringe of the discussion right now of 2016. There are bigger personalities out there like Governor Christie, uh, Governor Walker, Rand Paul, who are getting more headlines. But because Pence is a foreign policy hawk, he's a social conservative, as he clearly demonstrated in this interview, declining to say that there should be a litmus test or anything like that. Because he hits a lot of the different blocks of the GOP, he's someone who could be seen as a consensus candidate who could rise later in the race. Reed Epstein, he, he made it clear that whoever it is should come from the state level like himself. Do you think that is a, 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 a redeeming quality for voters, for the Republican base? Well, and it's clear that voters, not just Republicans, but Democrats, too, are, are angry with Washington. It's, it's, all you have to do is look at the congressional approval ratings that reach record lows every week and month. Uh, and so it's not a surprise to hear a governor say that, that the, the party's next standard bearer ought to be come, come from a state capital and not from the nation's capital. The question is sort of how does somebody who is uh, in Indianapolis, how do they uh, coalesce a lot of the, the party's uh, you know, various elements behind a, behind a nationwide campaign? It's, it's, it is hard, can be harder to do from a state capital when you have a day job running, the, running a, a state government uh, to be in Iowa or New Hampshire full time along with uh, you know, being in Washington, trying to recruit the sort of groups that you're going to need behind you to, to mount a national campaign. But don't you think Pence, in some ways, I think is better poised because Pence spent all this time in the House and he has connections with conservative groups across Washington. When I was covering him in the House, there was no one who was more plugged into the Heritage Foundation and the Club for Growth than Mike Pence. So I think you're right. It's very difficult for a governor to have a network, but I think Pence would come into it with that network he established here in Washington. And, and what about these outside groups, like Americans for Prosperity? He's going to go you know, speak before, for, before one of their large gatherings. What about the, you know, he's, 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 he's plugged in there, too. They like him a lot. They think he's someone who speaks the language of movement conservatism. And one thing you just noticed in this interview is that Pence, even though he's an outsider now, he's in Indianapolis, he started his career as a conservative talk radio host. He called himself kind of the, the soft-spoken Rush Limbaugh of Indiana when he started his career. So he's a communications professional. He has a nice patter. He, he's very disciplined in what he says and what he does not say. And so I think he's poised to be someone who could win hearts on the right and also handle this 24-7 volatile media age we live in. Reed Epstein, I, oh, go ahead. The question is, is he somebody who's going to get people excited, get activists in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, are they going to get excited to right, come out he's from not Mike Ted Pence? Cruz. He's not somebody who is uh, a bomb thrower like Ted Cruz. He's not somebody who is 
sort of an ideological hardliner uh, on some issues like Rand, uh, like Rand Paul, uh, and so he's gonna there's he's gonna have to navigate uh, sort of an inside passage on a lot of these things in order to if he wants to be a 2016. Yeah, read spot on. One thing about Pence is that his gubernatorial record is not a lot like Scott Walker or Chris Christie, who came out of the gate in their gubernatorial terms in 2010 and 2009 for Christie and really started to have these, these reforms that got nationwide attention. Pence has been pretty low-key. Uh, he's broken from Common Core on education. He's taken some trips abroad. But he doesn't have a, a record that's attracting the interest and excitement of activists. Yeah, and Reed Epstein, I mean, what, 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 Bob, what Bob just said about he's very careful about what he doesn't say, you, you pressed on him on immigration. He was very careful in, in his response to you. He was very careful on immigration. He was very careful on gay marriage, too. I mean, yeah. he, he made, made it clear that he's somebody who uh, personally is not for, not for same-sex marriage, but he also didn't draw uh, some, of the, some of the harder line on that that you see from some social conservatives who uh, you know, talk of constitutional amendments and, and things of that nature. Yeah, so, so what does that mean, though, for 2016 and whoever runs when you're hearing that from Governor Pence on those, those issues? I think it means he's giving himself, leaving himself a lot of leeway uh, to sort of draw that character... For, or draw that space for himself later. Uh, you know, if he wants to uh, come out and become a hardliner on, on some of those issues uh, in a year from now, he he can do so without being, uh, you know, without sort of seeing, looking like a flip flopper. Mm -hmm. If he wants to move towards the middle on some of those issues, if the Supreme Court were to make a broader ruling, he can say that it, he's said uh, he'll respect the rule of law. Bob Costa on this immigration issue. So the Republicans left without addressing, or the, the, the southern border issue didn't get it addressed. You read in the papers after that, Republicans really didn't need to for this 2014 midterm election, because if you look at their districts, a very small percentage of Hispanic voters. It wasn't going to hurt them in the midterm elections. They're up again in 2016, mm -hmm. though, as well. So how are Republicans in Washington going to balance that issue of trying to get their all their their their, ba their members reelected with their base yet at the same time have a candidate that's possibly open to courting some Hispanic voters. It's a difficult balance. Just listen to Pence's comments. He talks about how he's opposed in a sense to a path to legalization. He doesn't want to reward those who came here illegally. At the same time, he said in this interview, he Republicans need to show compassion on immigration. Well, what is compassion? He didn't really articulate policy-wise how Republicans demonstrate can demonstrate compassion to Hispanic voters. And that's going to be the question they have to answer ahead of 2016. As you say, it may not be important ahead of these midterms to get out the base, but ahead of 2016, if you want to build a national coalition, you have to connect policies to that compassionate thought. All right. Well, we will look, leave it there. Robert Costa with the Washington Post and Reed Epstein with the Wall Street Journal. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. If you missed any portion of our conversation with this week's newsmaker, Republican Governor Mike Pence of Indiana, you can hear an encore presentation at midnight Eastern here on C-SPAN Radio. The Heritage Foundation and National Review co-hosted a discussion about Immigration Thursday in Washington. Panelists discussed a range of issues, including the impact sequestration has had on border security and the increase of unaccompanied minors at the border. We'll also hear from Texas Republican Governor Rick Perry on a variety of issues, including immigration as well as the situation in Iraq. This runs about an hour and a half. Good morning, everyone. I am Genevieve Wood of The Daily Signal. We're the news organization here inside the Heritage Foundation. And on behalf of uh, President Jim DeMint uh, of Heritage and my Heritage colleagues, along with our friends at National Review, we welcome you to this event. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on in the world. But certainly something that has caught the attention of many Americans is the whole issue of our border. Is it secure? How that's affecting our country? How that will impact immigration reform as we move ahead? So that's what we want to talk about this morning. And I think we have a terrific panel uh, to kick off our session. And then, of course, we'll be hearing from the governor. Just a reminder, we will be taking questions at the end of our panel this morning. I will have microphones for you. So anyone who wants to ask a question, just raise your hand. We'll send a mic to you. You present your name and affiliation, and we'll go from there. So first, let me begin by introducing our panel. I'm going to introduce everyone, uh, and then they will each make their remarks. Uh, first speaking this morning is Jim Carafano. Jim is the Heritage Foundation's Vice President of Foreign and Defense policy studies. He oversees four centers here on the front lines of international affairs. The Allison Center, the Asian Studies Center, the Center for International Trade and Economics, and the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. 
Jim is an accomplished historian and teacher, as well as a prolific writer. He's the author and co-author of several books, including Winning the Long War, Lessons from the Cold War for Defeating Terrorism and Preserving Freedom, and his most recent book, Wiki at War, Conflict in a Socially Networked World. Jim has testified many times before Congress and is a regular guest analyst on television programs both here in the U.S. and around the world. He's also a 25-year Army veteran, rising to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He's a graduate of West Point. He holds a master's degree and a doctorate from Georgetown University, as well as a master's in strategy from the U.S. War College. Uh, Jim is going to be kicking us off talking about where we are on the border today and what the situation is there. Uh, following Jim will be Rich Lowry. Rich serves as the editor of National Review, which is a position he has held since 1997. Uh, Rich began his journalism career in college at the University of Virginia, where he edited a conservative monthly magazine called The Virginia Advocate. He later went on to work as a research assistant for Charles Crodhammer, who I know many here know, and is a reporter for a local paper in Northern Virginia before joining National Review in 1992. <coughs> Prior to his current position as editor, Rich covered Congress for NR and served as his article's editor. You've seen his byline in many newspapers, the New York Times, the LA Times, and others. He's a syndicated columnist and a commentator for Fox News. He's also the author of a New York Times bestseller, Legacy, Paying the Price, for the Clinton years. Uh, Rich will be talking about the whole debate over administrative amnesty and also where the GOP should be going in terms of how it thinks about immigration policy. Uh, following Rich will be Professor Ting. Professor is, is, uh, Ting is the professor of law at the Temple University Beasley School in Philadelphia. He joined that faculty in 1977 and teaches in the areas of citizenship and immigration law and tax law. His articles and media interviews related to those subjects have been published in law reviews and newspapers around the country, and he's been a commentator on numerous programs, including PBS, NewsHour, and NPR. Professor Ting has regularly testified before Congress, including before the 9-11 Commission and the Judiciary Committees of both the U.S. House and Senate. Professor Ting was Assistant Commissioner of the Immigration and Naturalization Service from in the early 90s, and he ran as a Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate from the state of Delaware in 2006. Professor Ting serves on the Board of Directors of the Center for Immigration Studies. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School and Oberlin College. Professor Ting is going to be speaking to us about the rule of law and how that specifically applies to immigration policies across the board. Uh, finally, she's not here yet, but joining us shortly will be Kellyanne Conway. Uh, Kellyanne is the founder and president of the polling company and Women Trends. Uh, she's one of the most sought after and well-known pollsters in the country. I'm sure many of you have seen her on TV. One reason she's very sought after, she's often right. Uh, her team were one of the few uh, on the Republican side of the aisle to use correct modeling and predict the outcomes of many of the major races uh, in 2012. She's the co-author of What Women Really Want, How American Women Are Quietly Erasing Political, Racial, Class, and Religious Lines to Change the Way We Live. Uh, throughout her two decades in market research, Kellyanne has provi provided research for clients in 46 of the 50 states. Uh, but she's not just involved in the political realm. Her clients go from policy organizations like Heritage and Freedom Works to leading brands of other industries, including Major League Baseball, American Express, and Lifetime Television. Kellyanne, her company just put out a, a study on immigration and how the American public is increasingly viewing this issue. It just came out this week. A lot of interesting findings, and she's going to share those with us. So to begin, we have a great panel. I'm going to hand it over to Jim Carafano. Jim. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, well, first of all, thank you for coming today. We really don't care where you stand on the issue, but it's an important issue in the fact that people are concerned about it and they, they want to have a dialogue and exchange on it. That means a lot, I think, and that's important. So I think the contribution I want to make today is to talk about on the border how we got here from there. Um, and this is something I actually, it, it's not just an academic subject for me. It's something I've been personally involved in over careers for back from when I was in the military with the Cuban boat lift to over a decade at Heritage where I, I visited the border several times with the uh, local law enforcement with uh, with federal agencies and, and also trips to Mexico. So um, you can really start the history of the border in, 19, in 1986 with the reform bill, because if you actually go back and read it, that reform measure, what it promised ought to resonate a lot with people today who talk about comprehensive reforms. It said, look, um, we're going to do an amnesty, we're going to clean the slate, 
Um, and then we're going to fix the problem going forward because we're going to we're going to deal with all the components. We're going to add border security. We are going to implement uh, uh, better visa programs so we can get the workers that employer need employers need to grow jobs and uh, uh, and um, and grow the economy. And we're going to force internal uh, immigration and workplace enforcement laws. So that was a promise. Um, well, we definitely did the amnesty. Um, we didn't do so much on on the visa reform and the worker reform uh, and the internal enforcement that was promised. But we actually did um, enhance border security, and and that's I think very interesting. That Dave Mulhausen is a terrific researcher here at Heritage. Did a um, fascinating stu study several years ago where he looked at the available social science research on the border, and uh, and what he concluded was there was actually a lot of consensus about what happened. And James Carafano. That is, um, we continually put more money and more resources on the border through the 1980s into the 1990s. We we act, government actually did what it promised. It did a lot more border security, and as a result of that, the unlawful population of the United States actually grew. It was about three million. Eventually, it grew to about. 16 million. So how did that happen? Well, in, in part it happened because um, since it was more difficult to get in, people that came in, instead of being more migratory in, in their uh, um, uh, in their employment, they'd come and do seasonal employment and go back to Mexico because the majority of the population came from Mexico. Since it was difficult to get back in, they would just stay. And, and since it also happened to coincide with the rise of the economy in the 1980s, in the late 1980s, and there was a lot of construction, you could actually have full-time year-round employment by going from seasonal job to seasonal job. So, <clears throat> so people stayed more. So that bumped up the population. <clears throat> the economy was growing, so people tried harder to get in because the transactional costs are pretty low. If you got, in a sense, thrown back, all you did was try to come back again until you got in. So the economic incentive of get it, getting in was, was far higher than the cost it was of getting caught and getting sent back. Cause uh, and then the third, of course, is um, that uh, only about, and the estimates on this while, while uh, vary a great deal, but you know, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent, we think of the population that's unlawfully present, actually came in through a legal point of entry and then simply overstayed their visas. So border security, no matter how much you wrap it up, doesn't affect that. As a matter of fact, the tougher your border security gets, actually the, the, the more growth you get in the unlawful population for, from people that come through legally and just overstay. So that problem continued to grow. Um, uh, and uh, and the next really big change happens on 9/11, and uh, and one of the things that 9/11 did was prompt the creation of the Department of Homeland Security that actually added some efficiency to what we were doing at the border because pretty much until that point we treated goods and people as two completely different things. One guy was in charge of goods, one guy was in charge of people, a different guy was in charge of internal enforcement, uh, and they had no real incentive or requirement to actually cooperate with each other or other federal agencies. So one of the things that the creating Department of Homeland Security did accomplish is they, they call it one face of the border and we did gain some greater efficiency uh, from how we address border security issues and and um, and that was good not just because of being concerned about security at the border but also recognizing that the border both the northern northern and the southern borders are economic engines for America and that an enormous amount of economic productivity occurs because of the process of crossing the northern and the southern border